Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, this year's Founding Historians Lecture for 2022 at the University of Sussex. My name is Ian McDaniel. I'm one of the two heads of the history department at the moment, and I'm a senior lecturer in intellectual history in the department. It's great to see so many of you here this evening, um, which is a major event in the university's programme of public lectures, as well as in the calendar of the history department. Um, the Founding Historians Lecture is in fact an occasion which is quite special for the history department of Sussex. It often demonstrates the wider significance and interest of history to the wider public and to Sussex's alumni. And I'm pretty sure tonight's lecture will be no different in that respect. I'm also really pleased to be introducing tonight's lecture, which as Peter has noted in his abstract, really chimes with some of the um, approaches to history um, that were pioneered in the department um, at Sussex since the university's inception. So I'm going to introduce Professor Peter Mandler, who is Professor of Modern Cultural History at the University of Cambridge and Bailey Lecturer in History at Gonville and Keyes College in Cambridge. He writes on the cultural, intellectual and social history of modern Britain and the Anglophone world, which has resulted in a body of work which is really quite remarkable in scope. Um, so that includes political and social histories of Victorian Britain and its empire, intellectual histories um, or intellectual biographies uh, and histories of the human sciences and I'm thinking of his work there on um, Margaret Mead along with really well-timed interventions in the debates about the value of history in the UK and also with the humanities more generally. His most recent book which has been recently sorry which has been widely reviewed and much praised is The Crisis of the Meritocracy Britain's transition to mass education since the Second World War, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2020. He has served as president of the Royal Historical Society and is currently in his final year as president of the Historical Association. He's a fellow of the British Academy and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, as you can see from the screen, the title of this evening's lecture is Voices from the Classroom, the Experience of Universal Secondary Education in the UK since 1945. And I'll hand over to you now, Peter. Thank you very much. I have to start out with an apology because as you will uh, hear and probably progressively hear more and more, um, I'm shaking off cold, which I've had for about two weeks, and it's making my voice deep and sexy um, and uh, gravelly, but I hope not incomprehensible. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, despite all the vicissitudes, I'm really genuinely delighted to um, be here at Sussex and um, honored to be asked um, uh, to give this annual lecture. Um, I actually grew up myself in a, in a new university of the 1960s. Um, my parents were among the founding academics of the University of California in San Diego, very different um, and yet strangely similar uh, institutions to the University of Sussex. And actually I now find myself writing about these um, utopian universities of the 1960s as they're called. So I have a kind of intellectual and a personal interest in them, but also I have um, my own ties um, to Sussex going back at least to the 1990s, where I actually spent quite a lot of time here one way or the other, two of my Closest friends then and, and collaborators, uh, Pat Thane and Mark Mazower, were here um, teaching history in the in the um, in the 90s. I was an external examiner at the end of the 90s, um, and um, but sadly, I haven't spent so much time here in the last 20 years because I, in 2001, I, I moved from London to Cambridge, and that put me at just one further remove. But I have pilgrimages down here to work in the archives, particularly. Um, in mass observation and the papers of Jeffrey Gore, who was Margaret Mead's, one of her many um, um, opposed husbands, though he didn't actually quite make it past the line, like <laughs> several others. Um, and I haven't come down ex except for those occasions. Um, but now that, that there's a direct train from Cambridge uh, to, uh, to Brighton, I'm hoping to uh, make this pilgrimage more regularly. So, Thank you for the invitation. Um, today, I want to share with you some findings from a um, collaborative project 
um, which is coming to the end of its research stage and moving into the writing up, um, that I've been engaged with my colleagues, uh, Laura Carter and Chris Jefferson. All aspects of the work are collaborative, so to share credit uh, on my opening slide. I must start by thanking them warmly for all the hard work and thought they have put into this project and for generously allowing me to share their research as well as mine with you. I also want to thank the many custodians of sometimes very private and intimate source materials who've allowed us to share the material in their care in a controlled and ethical manner, but one which allows us to glean many insights into past lives that would be inaccessible otherwise. It seems only appropriate in the home of the Mass Observation Archive to talk about these source materials that share many of mass observations distinctive features, their quirkiness, intimacy, and psychological depth. Our project aims to assess the impact of universal secondary education on people's lives in the post-war world. Young people's lives, their teachers, parents, and communities, their opportunities and outcomes. What difference did it make that before the Second World War, only 20% of young people had any experience of secondary education Many fewer obtained any school credentials and only one to two percent went on to higher education, whereas after the war, all young people spent several years in secondary education, growing numbers obtained credentials and now half proceed to higher education. Today, I'm going to offer um, three brief reports on our preliminary findings. Um, I can't obviously cover the, the, all, the whole experience of secondary education since the war. Um, that's going to be the work of our book and probably many other books to come. But three reports I want to make. First, one rooted in my own research on one school in the far northwest of England, on the limits of secondary modern education as experienced by most young people in the 50s and 60s. Second, based on Laura's work in the 1946 birth cohort study, and if you don't know what that is, I will explain later on how secondary modern girls understood and chafed against those limits in the 1960s. And third, based on Chris's work on Fife in Glasgow, on how Scottish teenagers became more focused on exam qualifications in the 1980s. But in addition to these findings, I do also want to address a broader methodological issue, that is the challenges of finding suitable source material on the experience of schooling. Oh, come on, I can hear you say. <laughs> You're a modern historian working on education. Surely the problem is too much information, uh, as my children used to say when they were teenagers. <laughs> it must be an embarrassment of riches. Uh, everyone has a story. I'm sure everyone here, by definition, everyone here has a story um, about the experience, your experience of universal secondary education. And um, seeing Hester Barron in the front row, I think, um, for example, of Claire Langemer and Hester's um, joint book, uh, both of this parish, uh, which brought to bear um, the wealth of mass observation material on Bolton in 1937 to craft a uniquely detailed and textured account of social experience, including richly schooling, in one Lancashire mill town in one year. You can write a whole book about that. So what's the problem? Well, it is a problem as well as an opportunity. For any massively distributed, highly heterogeneous subject such as education, especially education in Britain's very diverse and decentralized system, there is bound to be a huge amount of information as Langemer and Barron found for Bolton. But how do you ensure that a more extensive survey represents or reflects faithfully that massively distributed, highly heterogeneous experience across the four nations of the UK. Now, two obvious sources present themselves, one much used, the other not much used yet. The one we're most familiar with is oral history. Everyone, as I've said, has a story to tell about school. Surely that is a great asset. And yes, it is a great asset, but not everyone has the opportunity to tell their stories. Some very decent attempts have been made recently to found histories of schooling on oral history. And what they end up with is predominantly histories of grammar school, which tells us which section of the population is so far immersed in the public sphere of print to engage with oral historians. They're always the first in the queue, but not much about the vast majority who aren't. One recent study of women's education based largely on oral history interviewed 30 women 
20 of whom had gone to grammar school. The representative number would have been seven. Oral history, furthermore, is by definition retrospective. People read their own experiences back through the scrim of the present. As my colleague Simon Schredder found in his oral histories with Kate Fisher, tracking the experience of sex before the sexual revolution, this retrospectivity is a particular problem when a violent revolution in values and behaviors has intervened between the life events and the point of the oral history, such as applied both to the sexual revolution and to other major, major generational shifts in the last 70 years, especially in gender roles. It's harder to remember your past accurately when so much change has ensued since, and very often you're not happy with that change, especially when you get to a certain age, mine. Um, and so you tend to read uh, the past in, uh, in, in a rather glowing light and the present um, more harshly. So there are problems with the most obvious and readily available and often used source, oral history. The other obvious source, at least obvious to our team when we started our work, uh, is social media. Bringing school friends together to share memories was one of the early functions of social media. Anyone remember this one? <laughs> the website Friends Reunited was launched as early as 1999 and had recruited 15 million members by 2005. Unfortunately, such course sources are highly unstable. Friends Reunited could not compete with Facebook and it folded in 2016, just as our project was getting started. Its data may still survive in the bowels of the corporate behemoth DC Thompson, which now owns it, but Thompson tells us there's no way to access it. <laughs> Much of this activity is migrated to Facebook, but it is highly fragmented, privately controlled and manipulated, difficult to access ethically, though we have made some experiments in doing so, and of course has the same problems of selectivity and retrospectivity as does oral history. Uh, and Twitter's recent vicissitudes suggest how fragile social media platforms um, remain. So what's the solution? We don't, of course, make the best the enemy of the good by denying ourselves what is nearest to hand. We do use oral history and social media where we can, but a big part of our project has been exploring and exploiting better, more representative and less retrospective sources, searching for those typical voices from the classroom rather than atypical voices from a distance in time and space. Now, social scientists do have sources of this kind. They're mostly quantitative. Quantitative data collected from censuses, surveys, government reports, and so on, can give representative and contemporaneous snapshots of the entire population. The more such sources you have, the cleverer, the cleverer things you can do by juxtaposing and correlating them. If you know the family backgrounds of all students, for example, and their exam results, then you can make correlations which suggest the effect of family background on exam results. If you also know their later occupational history, you can co correlate background, exam results, and occupational outcomes, as in this table compiled by the sociologist John Goldthorpe, which shows that education benefits everyone, but lack of education hinders the already privileged less. I'm not going to go into the details of this. It's one of my favorite tables produced by quantitative social scientists tells you a lot, but it only tells you so much. Because there are strict limits to what you can do, even with heaps of quantitative data. Only some things were measured at the time. I mean, you know, obviously we, we do have data about people's family backgrounds um, and their qualifications and their occupations, um, but we don't have lots of data on the things in between. Things that were measured were often put into classifications that served contemporary purposes, but not ours. And correlation is not the same as causation. We may know that there is a connection between family background and exam results, but this doesn't tell us much about how it works. For example, we really need to know how it works in order to develop policies to counteract it. In our project, we have sought therefore to uncover new sources that have the representativeness and contemporaneity of social science data, but also the richness of meaning and experience of oral history sources. Such sources might provide better explanations for the, for the quantitative trends and also identify other hidden trends that the quantitative sources can't reveal. So each of my three vignettes will also tell us about these unusual sources 
massively distributed and representative and contemporaneous, and we think full of meaning. Let's start from the immediate post-war and look at secondary modern schools, where most children were educated across the United Kingdom between the 1940s and the 1970s. Secondary modern was the English and Welsh usage in Northern Ireland, they were called intermediate and in Scotland, junior secondary schools. In England and Wales alone, there were about 4,000 of these schools by the 1960s. That's quite striking. There are only about 4,000 secondary schools of all kinds in, um, in Britain today, because schools were smaller then. But there were 4,000 of uh, secondary modern schools. You can imagine how hard it is to get a handle on that large number of schools. Many of them jerry-rigged from older elementary schools and still searching for a distinctive mission. What were some of the ideas about that mission and how did these ideas fit with their students and their parents' aspirations and ambitions? To answer this question, we looked among other things at records of secondary modern schools themselves. Pretty much every secondary school in the UK after 1945 kept an archive of records, rather miscellaneous, but with some consistent features. In many ways, the most interesting is the logbook, which state elementary schools had long been required, I mean, since the late 19th century, to keep on a more or less daily basis. And now this responsibility after the war extended to the new state secondary schools. Their main purpose was to record legal obligations, teachers' hirings and firings, uh, pupil absences, school trips, injuries and punishments, numbers on the roll, admissions and destinations. But some heads, as we will see, used the logbook as a kind of confessional, recording their own feelings about their challenges and successes, where the school was headed, what was its ethos, real or imagined. Other typical records preserved range from admissions request registers, which tell you about the catchment, feeder schools, even family backgrounds, leavers registers for, uh, for trajectory from school to further education or work, punishment books, which speak sometimes alarmingly for themselves. I probably shouldn't say this, I hope there are no archivists present, but you'd be surprised how many punishment books are available to researchers without any data protection coverage. They, there are lots of secrets that they have uh, within. I mean, we're of course very careful when we use these sources. Um, governor's minutes, which are a variable usefulness. Anyone who's been a school governor can know knows about that. Um, PTA minutes, almost always enlightening about the wider community. And in some ways, best of all, school magazines, which go through several transformations from very stodgy, yet still bursting with the energy of student work and extracurricular activity in the 1950s, as on the left, to revolutionary and blazingly creative in the 1970s, as on the right. We've been puzzling over purple cardigans rule okay for quite a while. There was obviously some local secret that was being given there. And alongside the common sources, all of these sources are ones you typically find in school records, lots of miscellanea and ephemera, photo albums, samples of student work, testimonials to beloved teachers on retirement, those are great, uh, floor plans, timetables, you name it. Now, of course, schools differed greatly in the faithfulness with which they recorded these things and with which they preserved them. And grammar and independent schools are, of course, overrepresented. But nearly every school kept something, at least a logbook and governor's minutes. And mostly these are lodged in the county and city record offices of their local authority. Furthermore, every school has another kind of record lodged centrally in the National Archives. That is the school inspector's reports, HMI. These reports, while formulaic to some degree, are also surprisingly full of human interest. I have to say, they're a lot more, uh, a lot more full of human interest for the 50s, 60s, and 70s than Ofsted reports are today. Which they're just written in bureaucraties, but the HMI reports from the earlier period are, um, like the school magazines, bursting with human insight. Inspectors had strong views as to what should be the ethos of the school, and also strong views on what it actually was, and they were as careful to record their impressions of these intangible things as of the nuts and bolts. They give an excellent outsider's view that complements the various insider's views from school records. So we can select out any type of school we like in surveying school records, 
And by ranging around the country, we can compile a set of sample schools for which we write up school portraits that are both roughly representative and contemporaneous, not overrepresenting the best record keepers like grammar and independent schools. And that's what we've done. There's one limit we can't overcome. There are thousands of schools represented in local record offices with its rich body of material, but their records nearly all run out by the 1980s. Why is this? I suspect multiple reasons. Comprehensive reorganization made a lot of schools feel like they were beginning from ground zero in the 70s or 80s, even if they were in fact simply rebadged versions of older schools, as many of them were. Comprehensives were also often self-consciously modern and wanted to distance themselves from past discredited school systems. If you merged an old grammar school with a relatively new secondary modern, what was your history? You didn't want to make it the grammar school, so you just started from scratch. And then the internet dealt a devastating blow. By the 2000s, most school records were kept in digital form only. Sometimes they were mounted in archives on websites, but looking at websites of most secondary schools today is a woeful experience for an historian. Academies like Tom's think they are starting from ground zero, especially I fear those in multi-academy trusts. The last thing they want to do is affiliate themselves to their older selves um, by preserving records. And I can tell you some really horror stories about what head teachers have said to me um, or to my informants about their history. Our hope in our project is that their digital records do still exist somewhere and we're in the process of trying to write all school governors with this same plea as well as to, to preserve their archives, to, as well as to work with the School Archives and Records Association, you won't be surprised to hear that the School Rec Archives and Records Association is dominated by independent schools. So again, it's not very representative. Um, but we're hoping to work through governors and SARA, asking that they identify what historical records can still be found and get them deposited in the relevant local record office where they can join up with their earlier paper predecessors. If any of you are school governors, if any of you have children in schools, if any of you remain, retain ties to your old school, ask them now, what have they done with their digital records? And can they not deposit what they have in the local record office? And archivists, as you won't be surprised to hear also, are actually quite keen to get digital records because they're relatively easy to store and um, catalog and um, their space is essentially infinite, whereas paper records are um, tend to clutter up the shelves. Okay, with that little homily behind us, let me tell you just one story from school records. It's a story of a single school, not itself at all typical, but only one of many we are canvassing, and its records tell a particularly revealing and moving story about secondary modern schools in the post-war decades. This school is Ingleton, on the edge of the Yorkshire Dales. Like many rural districts, um, Ingleton had before the war an all-age school, essentially elementary, that drew from a wide catchment, which in 1949 became a secondary modern school to implement the Butler Act's requirement that all local authorities transfer their elementary pupils to a secondary at 11. It was always a small two-form entry school of under 400 students, and in, in its early years, it remained essentially elementary in character under, the, under an elderly and distracted headmaster. Its dozen teachers were unspecialized and underqualified. The inspectors found it in 1953 to be a rather grim place with little life in it, its students well behaved but overdrilled, marked by their isolation on scattered farms, shabby and stilted in manner. The school had none of the graciousness and good taste that was supposed to be conveyed by the new secondary education. And in truth, not much secondary education was on offer especially given that attendance varied wildly with the agricultural seasons. A new broom swept in with the arrival of uh, a new head in the early 1950s, C.F. Neal. Neal had a firm idea of what a good secondary modern school should be. <coughs> he introduced music and drama, an annual festival of lessons and carols, concerts, talks, films, and an annual school play. Trips were organized to France and Switzerland, and French was now taught to some children, at least in the fourth form. <coughs> More specialist teachers were hired and incentives to harder work introduced, such as house competitions, prizes, homework, school uniform, the new CSE exam. Neil's style was firmly authoritarian. 
The inspectors, HMI, found he left little initiative to teachers. His own subject, English, was favored, and most teaching in all subjects was by rote. <coughs> Girls did not, did not get a fair shake. HMI thought that the students were now more friendly and responsive, but still not socially mature, still lacked the poise or sense of style that a secondary education ought to instill. And Neil also had a very firm idea of what a secondary modern was not. It was not a course, of course, a place for anyone to express themselves. Students still less than teachers. In his annual speech day reports in the 60s, recorded in the logbook, he railed against jeans and other weird forms of dress. Teddy boy trousers and shoes, slovenliness, neglect of the Christian virtues, late nights, and promiscuity, blaming parents for their permissiveness. But perhaps more oddly, given his commitment to hard work and discipline, he also set himself against his students and their parents' academic aspirations. The CSE exam, designed for secondary moderns, he thought was best suited to his charges abilities and likely occupations mostly still in agriculture or factory work. Citing Ecclesiasticus 40, the life of one that laboreth and is contented shall be made sweet. He preached stoicism and acceptance of one's lot. So when parents hinted that their children might benefit from attempting O-levels, the academic grammar school exam, he resisted, once again, blaming this excessive ambition on parents' permissiveness, spoiling their children. His problem was the parents were <laughs> playing with their feet. Other schools were offering O-levels and they took their children to them, especially after a comprehensive school opened in nearby Settle in 1958. The Ingleton rolls fell from 375 in 1957 to 200 by 1967. And the head's grievances deepened, not only because the 60s spirit deepened, but also because he had left himself with an intake creamed of ambition which turned out not to be an improvement, but rather the reverse. His speech day reports plunge deeply into the dark night of his soul. <laughs> Children were arrogant in their ignorance. Old virtues of truthfulness, honesty, kindness, and consideration of others were going by the board. Life the present was being made easy for the drifter. Now it is possible to make a living by having children. This way of life would have made our parents blush with shame. He was saved from his misery only by retirement in 1971. <laughs> One of the first acts of the new head was to lead a school party to a pop concert at the Fortin M6 service station. <laughs> in 1973, the school went comprehensive. I hope he didn't live to see that, <laughs> having a pop concert. I think probably heads who retire at, at, in, in, in old age like uh, Partners whose partners die in old age often, often kick the bucket shortly thereafter. So we can hope that Neil might have been spared the pop concert at the service station. The light cast by these records helps to explain something which we can observe but not easily explain. Even in the 1950s, most parents wanted more for their children than secondary moral schools could or would provide. Local authorities responded to these desires in a variety of ways by offering O levels in secondary moderns, making them comprehensive in waiting. Uh, or by selecting not at 11, but later at 14 or 15, or by opening comprehensives as in subtle. By 1963, most informed commentators deemed the 11 plus to be doomed. And it's hard to find evidence of parent and student pressure at the grassroots to explain this. And historians tend to fall back on top down explanations, especially the favorite one that Tony Crossland abolished the grammar schools in 1965 after the great majority of local authorities had already determined to do so. In my own book on this uh, subject, excuse the plug, written when our current project was just getting underway, I moaned about how hard it was to get a sense of parents and students' attitudes and how or whether they registered on school and local authority policy. Why did local authorities mostly decide to give up the 11 plus before um, they were told to do so by the government? And my hypothesis was that this came from pressure from below, but it was very hard. And I had surveyed data, quantitative data, but I had no qualitative data to demonstrate this. Now I do. The school records give us a direct contemporaneous glimpse into parents and students changing aspirations, and also in this case, the consequences of resisting them visited upon a poor beleaguered head in his magically shrinking school. My second source uh, may be more familiar than school records like the long book, but perhaps not, I think, um, as that it's still one of the great underappreciated British contributors 
uh, to our understanding of the modern world. And this is the unparalleled sequence of birth cohort studies that have been undertaken at intervals since 1946. These studies take a large representative sample of all people, I mean thousands, um, born in a given year, and follow them throughout their lives, prodding and poking and asking questions every few years on all manner of subjects, medical, political, social, economic, and of course, educational. Every time I talk about the birth cohort studies, I always ask the audience, is there anyone here who is a member of one of the national birth cohort studies? You have to have been born in the first week of March in 1946, 58, 70, um, or uh, 2000. And if you weren't, you're not in. But thousands of people are. They are the source of much of the quantitative data that social scientists use to develop these sophisticated correlations between family background and school performance and occupational trajectory. Lesser known, however, is the qualitative material still hidden in their questionnaires and interviews. The idiosyncratic scribblings of tens of thousands of informants has proven much harder to fathom or even to access than the quantitative data they provide, which can be and has been easily reduced to neat tabular rows and columns. This is because most of the questionnaires were designed with a fixed set of answers. Those answers could be coded and aggregated, turned into numbers, but there were also opportunities for free text replies directly recording <coughs> voices from the classroom, which couldn't be coded and have by and large therefore been totally ignored. You can see, for example, in the, in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a question, which is just a general question about yourself and your opinions of life. And there's no code, it's the red letters. Um, uh, it's just encouraging people to talk about themselves. And the assumption was that maybe someday someone would read these things and make some sense of them in a way that you can't with quantitative analysis. And finally, someone is. <laughs> now, we haven't read um, tens of thousands of free text replies. What we have done is to ask a data, a data specialist, J.D. Carpentier, to select for us a sample of the cohort participants, making sure we had reasonable numbers of all the representative categories. For example, a reasonable number of secondary modern girls, and of some categories less representative, but of special interest to us, for example, ethnic minority children. <coughs> Laura, who has been working on the 1946 cohort, that is born in the first week of March 46, has read through all the survey responses from a subsample of 36 girls who went to secondary modern schools in England, Wales, and Scotland between 1957 and 1963, including hundreds of pages of these free text responses. Now, 36 may not sound like a lot, but oral historians will know 36 is a lot. No oral history project would even try to reach that many girls born in a single year educated only in secondary modern schools. Um, and Laura has dozens more to draw on, should she need to, both from further examples, samples of the 46 cohort. I mean, we could go on endlessly pulling out secondary modern girls from the 46 cohort and also from a nearly simultaneous cohort study of a thousand families in Newcastle. By contextualiz contextualizing our sam subsample, with the quantitative data of the full cohort of 5,000 participants. We can thus both glean direct testimonies from these secondary modern girls and their parents, by the way, and also fit them into the bigger pattern of all children of their age growing up in the UK in the 50s, 60s, because we know who these girls are and how they are distinctive and how they are typical. From those free text responses, especially the questions about their school experiences posed just after leaving school, Laura has been able to get at the students rather than just their parents' and teachers' ambitions, and how far they were realized by their school experiences. Now, girls at secondary modern schools after the war were generally expected to be preparing for wife and motherhood. Housecraft, cookery, dressmaking, housekeeping, was their most important subject, typically taught in a modern purpose-built housecraft flat. It was also often the subject they appreciated the most. But by the time the 1946 cohort reached secondary school in the late 50s, it was becoming more common for girls to be aiming at a dual role. Wife and mother, yes, but also a worker, even if only part-time during the years of childbirth. For girls from secondary modern schools, this work is likely to mean low skill and low pay work in shops and factories. Now, it might be thought that the housecraft orientation of their schooling and the low expectations of girls who had failed the 11 plus might have caused these girls growing to adulthood in the 60s before feminism had made much of an inroads. 
to be satisfied with their destinations as wives, mothers, and part-time workers in whatever jobs they could get contributing to the family income. And indeed, they do not express much dissatisfaction with their failure to pass the level plus, mostly because they really didn't expect otherwise, didn't know otherwise, or indeed with their secondary modern schools per se. But what Laura also finds is that their aspirations were a great deal higher than their attainments, even if those aspirations were still couched in traditionally gendered terms. What were the job aspirations of these girls at the dawn of the 60s, at the end of their schooling? <clears throat> As you can see, by far the most popular jobs were nurse, shorthand typist, hairdresser, and teacher in that order, together accounting for over two thirds of all secondary modern girls. These are recognizably jobs compatible with and no doubt stemming from traditional expectations of girls as future wives and mothers. But what we might not appreciate now is that they were all also highly skilled jobs that required qualifications or connections generally not available to the secondary modern girls. Mostly you needed some O-levels to aspire to these jobs because O-levels were the gateway to further training. By definition, overwhelmingly, it would be grammar school girls who had these O-levels, even the new practical O-levels in subjects such as needlecraft. And even if an O-level wasn't technically necessary, for example, to acquire shorthand and typing qualifications, girls with O-levels were always likely to outcompete girls without them. In contrast, secondary modern boys had the option of apprenticeships to lead to more skilled work, often available without O-levels, though also favoring those with. We often forget that the principal occupation for grammar school boys after they left school in the 50s and 60s was an engineering apprenticeship. I mean, these are not sent, people sent, being sent on to university because hardly anyone went to university still. So boys went into apprenticeships, but girls didn't have this option. There was an apprenticeship route to hairdressing, but in practice, this was severely limited. And again, middle-class girls with access to capital or private training were often first in the queue. Secondary modern schools were truly at the bottom of the heap. And actually, I, I think this is not that dissimilar, maybe sadly similar to some of the, 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 the gulf between expectations and realities that, that Claire and, and Hester found in Bolton, 1937, with um, girls in the senior classes of primary. The free text answers to questions about their trajectories into work after leaving school also show how keenly aware secondary modern educated women were of this disappointment. And here I think the fact that these post-war girls had gone to secondary school made a difference and maybe differentiated them from um, children who had left school uh, before the war without a secondary education. Laura describes what she nicely calls the hairdresser blues. One girl who had aspired to work in the dressmaking trade was very disappointed that her failure to pass O-level needlework and her employer's refusal to release her for part-time study stymied both her talents and her ambitions. Three girls who aspired to be hairdressers were frustrated by their lack of access to apprenticeships and ended up working in factories and snack bars. Another girl who had wanted to be a hairdresser had to go to work for her mother instead as a bookbinder and ended up abandoning paid work altogether, falling back on the traditional aspirations. As one social worker observed of her age 16, she is courting steadily. Sure enough, she was married with a baby by 18. In fact, only a handful of the 36 girls were in paid work by age 26. <clears throat> These contemporaneous reflections on school, work, and family by secondary modern girls allow Laura also to identify what it was about hairdressing and the other highly desirable jobs that appealed to these girls. Yes, there was the satisfaction of doing work that drew on both their own deeply ingrained and gendered values and on what they learned from their mothers and from their schooling, but there were also repeated expressions of a desire for creativity and autonomy. One of the frustrated hairdressers had stood out among her contemporaries for her creativity with her own body, dyeing her hair and painting her nails. These were uh, exceptional qualities in 15-year-olds um, in the early 60s. Others said explicitly that they yearned for a job that was less routine than low-skill factory or shop work and unfettered by a boss constantly looking over your shoulder. Hairdressing and dressmaking also offered the long-term prospect of self-employment in a small business, some kind of peak ideal. But these longer-term prospects, as the quantitative data reveals, were also likely to be reserved for grammar school girls with O levels, and equally importantly, with social contacts and some access to capital. This level of experiential and emotional detail helps to explain a lot 
why the parents at Ingleton, my school, were so keen to get their children to take O-levels, and how even within fairly conventional gender norms, working class girls' rising aspirations were not satisfied by the opportunities they did have coming out of secondary modern schools. Here we have direct evidence of, uh, I think, of what is sometimes called vernacular feminism. Rising aspirations of girls, as much in the secondary modern as in the grammar school, greater frustration about the actual outcomes, and a sharpening awareness of women's disabilities compared even to working class men. This vernacular feminism would lay down a foundation that could be activated by a more ideological feminism in the 1970s. Finally, I turn to Chris Jefferson's work on the Scottish school leader surveys of the 1980s and 90s, my third source. Since the 60s, the Scottish Education Department has been systematically surveying school leavers, that is, young people aged variously between 15 and 19, <coughs> mostly with fixed choice questions about their school and work experiences that could be coded again for use by <laughs> society. So we have, these have been used extensively, we have the data, the, the, the raw data about what they say about school and work. Um, between 1977 and 1998, however, an extended questionnaire was employed, and this one has hardly been looked at by the social scientists, um, which concluded with an open-ended question, <laughs> uh, encouraging respondents to tell more about themselves and leaving a considerable space for a free text reply. Much like Laura's free text responses in the birth cohort study, these responses often gave young people an opportunity, just as they were leaving the school, to <laughs> reflect on their place within the system, both schooling and the labor market, and the connections between them, which gives us unusually deep and again broadly representative insight into young people's experiences. Now again, we can't claim to have read through all these thousands of free text responses, but with technical assistance, Chris has selected a representative sample of a thousand questionnaires. That's a lot from Fife and Glasgow between 1983 and 1991. This period is particularly interesting because it was both a period of high youth unemployment and a period of rapidly growing attainment of formal educational credentials. Of course, attainment of credentials have been growing steadily over the preceding decades, all that pressure to take O-levels that I illustrated in my previous case studies paying off. But the late 80s in particular proved to be the seedbed of the near, nearly universal attainment of school exams and the mass higher education participation that we know today. At the time, the juxtaposition of high youth unemployment and rapidly growing attainment was confusing to policymakers and social scientists. In a market economy, they expect young people in periods of high unemployment to offer themselves to employers for lower wages in order to improve their employment prospects. Or at best, they might be expected to sign up to the many low wage training schemes on offer to give better access to jobs. What they were not expected to do was to stay out of the labor market, to aspire to and even attain exam credentials that were widely held to be useful, even feasible, only to a more academic minority. I mean, unemployed youth. These are not the people you expect to be getting passing and uh, taking passing exams. Economists were surprised by the, this uh, tendency to stay on in school and take exams, which they started to call parking. That is, young workers were taking up educational opportunities temporarily to wait out unemployment. It seemed to the economists an anomalous short term response to anomalous short term unemployment. And economists never understand unemployment, it shouldn't happen. When employment opportunities were covered, it was assumed these young people would give up education and go back to the labor market. But over the course of the 80s, as youth unemployment subsided, this supposed parking activity only intensified. And economists were stumped. How could it be the take up of educational opportunity was unrelated to the state of the labor market? It went up when the labor market went down, and it went up when the labor market went up. Hmm. Clearly, some sort of breakthrough was achieved in the 1980s, a change of culture, not economics. Education was now seen as more desirable, whatever the short-term state of the economy, by nearly everyone. Even among young people from manual working class backgrounds, whereas only 25% stayed on in school past the compulsory age of 16 in 1980, by 1994, over 56% from the same backgrounds were staying on. So there's an explosion of staying on um, past 16. As I say, economists in particular have difficulty understanding such big shifts as this. As a theory-driven discipline, they tend to rely on human motivations remaining fairly stable. And as a data-driven discipline, they rely on the key motivations being the things they measure, things like unemployment levels and attainment rates. 
Now they do have a reasonable explanation for this shift towards educational attainment over the long term, which is that the economy has become, since the 1970s, much more oriented to cognitive skills. So it makes sense for more people to acquire evidence of cognitive skills before they enter the labor market. More jobs require higher level cognitive skills. Those in turn are cultivated and recognized by educational qualifications. No doubt this is what the growing appetite for taking O-levels was partly about, though it long preceded deindustrialization. I mean, the pressure to take O-levels was taking off in the late 50s at the height of industrial employment. And in fact, the attainment of qualifications has always run ahead of changes in the labor market. The free text responses to the school labor surveys do show plenty of evidence of a general awareness of labor market, increased labor market demand for qualifications. The Scottish leavers in the 80s were much more likely to speak directly to the value of credentials and specifically to O-levels as even the Scottish uh, uh, leavers who were taking O-grade exams called them. They were much more likely to speak directly to the value of O-levels than were Laura's secondary modern schools in the 60s. And that no doubt, no doubt reflects greater awareness of the emergent knowledge economy. But there was also, they were also very aware that something special and dramatic um, was happening in the 1980s. In fact, youth employment opportunities were in decline across the board in all sectors, not just those in long-term decline. And the Thatcher government's new low-skill youth training schemes were not seen as attractive alternatives. In fact, in Scotland, they were actively disliked and resisted more than elsewhere on political as well as economic grounds. So the youth unemployment of the 1980s was a wake-up call, even for relatively low attaining youth in Scotland. And they grabbed at the only alternative that was now with comprehensive education more widely available to them, that is staying on to achieve O grades and hires. And once embarked upon, this course was not abandoned. Across the 80s, Chris finds young people increasingly more comfortable with staying on at school after 16, increasingly more confident in their ability to attain exam qualifications, and eventually, as the labor market recovered, more confident in their ability to get a good job after they had qualified. Strikingly, young people's feelings about school, including after the school leaving age, were very much more positive by the early 90s than they had been in the early 80s. The angry young working class men lashing out against school and teachers, frequently observed by sociologists in schools of the 1970s, were giving way to young people better acculturated to school, and not by Thatcherism or even by labor market discipline but perhaps the opposite, by their greater optimism about the value of school for life, and certainly their greater comfort with the ethos of schooling as a norm amongst their peers. In other words, we can see a new culture of schooling emerging that the economists can only guess at by observing staying on rates and, on, and employment data. What I hope to have shown you this evening is that studying such a massively distributed phenomenon such as modern schooling does require more information New sources beyond the thick but unrepresentative and retrospective evidence of oral history and social media, and beyond the contemporaneous and representative but thin evidence of quantitative data. But I also hope to have, hope to have shown you that historians' skills of interpretation become more important in addressing these new sources. Our willingness to probe deep into the hearts and minds of people in the past, our striving never entirely successfully to shed the preconceptions of our own time, and our openness to the often unfamiliar and unpredictable attitudes and behaviors of others. These are all historian skills vital to understanding, even perhaps especially something as apparently familiar as post-war education. I am often told the problems I discuss in these three case studies have obvious answers, not the ones I've given you. These obvious answers are usually related to top-down or very elite preoccupations. The 11 plus was largely eradicated because Tony Crossland abolished grammar schools. Girls' opportunities changed because feminism freed them in the 1970s. Young people work harder and get more exam qualifications today because Thatcherism forced them to do so. <laughs> These are not completely empty answers, but they are misleading and partial. And I've tried to reveal how much more is going on in the lives and minds of young people growing up in post-war Britain. Peter, thank you very much for sharing your uh, current research with us. That was really fascinating. I love the way the stories about culture kept coming back in there. 
Um, the vote of thanks is going to be um, read or given by uh, my colleague Hester Barron in the history department, who is now professor of modern history um, at Sussex, and whose recent book, most recent book, is entitled "The World of the." I should know this. The world of the school. I don't know the subtitle. The social world of the school, education and community in interwar London, uh, 2022. Thanks, Hester. Thank you, um, and thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to read the privilege of. Uh, giving the vote of thanks, which means that it's my job to convey the thanks of the audience to Peter for such a stimulating lecture. Um, but before that, if I could take the opportunity of just saying a few personal uh, words of thanks. Um, so going back to before the pandemic, um, I really benefited, Peter, from your intellectual generosity when I was writing uh, my book, The Social World of the School. Um, and you first went beyond the call of duty in your kind of deep engagement with the proposal as an anonymous uh, reviewer. Um, but then after you unmasked yourself, <laughs> um, yeah, your continued willingness to give advice and support, um, it made it a better book. Um, and I'm, uh, I will always be grateful to you for it. Um, I also know that there are people, uh, colleagues in the history department at Sussex who speak very warmly of the support and help that you've given them in the past. <gasps> and it seems typical of your collegiate um, uh, uh, attitude um, that your, your collegiate approach that you share the limelight um, so readily um, tonight, they've gone off the screen, yeah. um, but with your, um, the two postdocs who worked with you in the project, uh, Chris Jefferson and Laura Carter, uh, the audience won't know that um, the book, The um, Crisis of the Meritocracy, which we saw a brief uh, cover of, um, that uh, Peter dedicated that book to Chris and Laura, um, which I think is very telling. To speak a little bit about the significance of the project that the three of them have been working on, um, I'm struck that there's often a, a, a ghettoization of the history of education, not helped by the fact that in some universities um, there is literally a departmental separation between historians of education who are in the education department and then historians who are in history. Um, and the history of education also has to fight a reputation within the discipline, uh, not a particularly deserved reputation anymore, I don't think, but, but nevertheless a reputation for quite dry, dusty, policy-based history that's not particularly innovative. For whatever reason, social historians of modern Britain haven't generally paid enough attention to education, um, and there's been a lot of work recently that works in um, nuanced and interesting ways about community and identity and looking at the complexities of class and gender and ethnicity. But many of them pay very little, if any, sometimes, um, attention to children's experiences or the social history of schooling. And yet education matters. Um, and if I could quote from, uh, again, from Peter's book, uh, The Crisis of Meritocracy, um, uh, in it, Peter, you write, in the 20th century, schools and universities have become not only motors of economic growth and cockpits of citizenship, but also the most important theatres of socialisation outside the family. They stand, therefore, on the front line of social change. And so Peter's work shows why education matters. So both in, uh, in his last book and in the work that he's talked about tonight, he and his team show that education mattered not just to policymakers and educationists, uh, to economists, uh, to the government, but to those on the ground, uh, to parents and to pupils themselves. And so the expansion of secondary education was led by demand. Children wanted more, parents wanted more for their children, even if sometimes those aspirations couldn't be fulfilled. Um, and I thought your discussion of, of children's aspirations, um, aspirations that they often had no hope of achieving, um, was really quite moving. And I, I, I agree, I think it's similar to the kind of um, asp or thwarted aspirations that Claire and I found in the 1930s. Um, and it's sad that, that you know, in the, in the later period, those aspirations were still not being realised. 
Thinking about education from the bottom up, bottom up is also significant uh, because this has been so often framed as a uh, top-down narrative. Um, so elsewhere, um, Peter, you've described this project as being about a worm's eye view rather than a bird's eye view. The history of education was traditionally um, almost exclusively top-down. It was about policy, it was about legislation. And that's changed in recent years, and historians of education and childhood are uh, trying much harder to get inside the classroom and particularly to get the holy grail, which is children's voices. Um, it's often led to a reliance on oral history and memoir, um, but as Peter showed, um, that has problems, particularly the over-reliance, uh, the over-representation of ex-grammar school pupils. Um, Peter, we've got some Sussex undergraduates in the audience today, and our Sussex third years are currently um, uh, uh, choosing their dissertation topics, they're currently trying to identify sources, um, and I know that your talk will have um, inspired them, and your work is, is a wonderful demonstration that sources can be found, even when we start off not quite sure what we're going to look for or what we're going to find, um, and of course it also reminds us that being a historian is also about the hard graft um, that we put in to find them as well. So on behalf of everyone at Sussex, everyone in the room, I'd like to thank you again um, for a fantastic lecture and could you please all join me in um, your appreciation for Professor Peter Mandler.